I'm Claire Norris. I'm the Senate Secretary. I teach English. And I'm the co-chair of the Student Success Committee. Uh, and I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker. And I'm so excited to be introducing to you Dr. Derek Smith. Um, he, you, you, I'm sure you read his bio in your packet. It talks about all the good work that he's done with the June Jordan Center and Learning Works and other, other things. Uh, so instead of reading that to you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm so happy that he's here. Um, so especially this year as we're focusing on cultural competence and issues of equity. Uh, so I first heard of Derek Smith in June of 2012 when, again, I was looking for a speaker to come and talk to us about issues of equity and I got a recommendation from Deborah Harrington at the district office and she, she knew him so she recommended him. And so, you know, I reached out, I think we talked on the phone once, um, I did a little research, and, uh, but for some reason we ended up with someone else um, that year. So I didn't really think much of it. And then, in the fall of 2013, uh, at the Strengthening Student Success Conference that happens in California every year, guess who was the keynote speaker? Dr. Smith. Uh, so I, so I sat in the audience of about 800 community college professionals, and I was, um, after it was over, I was devastated. Because after his talk, I knew that he would be booked forever and ever, and we could never get him uh, to speak here at West. Um, especially since he, he addressed issues of race and equity uh, and in frank ways that I had not heard in that kind of public setting in the community college platform. Uh, so then, fast forward to this year, in April, um, I saw that at one of our district student success summits, he was going to speak. Uh, and I was really excited. So I signed up right away, and I got there early, and I was sitting there. And there he talked uh, about how important the community college system is, that it's the most important system because we have access to, um, to communities of people that, that other systems may not have access to. And because of that, the obligation that we have to develop our faculty into master educators and teachers. And so I was, again, inspired. And that day I said, OK, whatever I need to do, I'm going to work with my colleagues, or we're going to get in here and speak to you. So, um, so even though Dr. Smith has revealed to me after talking for the last couple of months in anticipation of this day that he doesn't necessarily relish talking in front of large groups. Um, he, he gets what he has to offer and the value of it, so he does it anyway. Uh, so um, you may have noticed in your packets that you have sheets where you can take notes. Because after this, in our breakout sessions, we're going to go and get a chance to kind of debrief on Dr. Smith's talk and, and reflect on that. So it will be great, you know, people bring notes with them and we have these great discussions. And then as you saw in your program this afternoon after lunch, we're going to come back together and do a wrap-up session with Dr. Smith. So it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Derek Smith. Uh, my name is Derek Smith. I'm from Oakland, California. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm having some technical difficulties. That's all right. Whatever. Um, teaching is older than this technology. So what are you going to do? And most of the effective teaching in the world happens without PowerPoints and without technology. Uh, <laughs> um, for those of you that like to use PowerPoint, that's not a knock against PowerPoint. Uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't use it. I, I'm saying that throughout most of the world, even in countries that whoop our tails and in cognitive development for students, they're not using PowerPoints in, in many of the classrooms. It's just good old fashioned teaching. And many of you learn the best skills that you have without the use of PowerPoint. And many of your parents taught you things in a matter of seconds without a lot of visual aids. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> and so uh, anyhow, so um, and speaking of technology, my cell phone with my other notes on it just died. So um, everything's going swell. <laughs> um, but a just a little bit about, about me uh, so you know who's talking to you. Uh, I'm 40 years old, so that puts me uh, graduating from high school in 1992. All right, the, the movie Straight Outta Compton just came out, and I haven't seen it yet. Um, I think I bought one NWA album, and I think I had the DOC. People don't know what I'm talking about here. Uh, uh, <laughs> I had like two Dr. Dre albums and like three Ice Cube albums. Okay, um, but I wasn't like a die-hard NWA fan. Like, oh, I love NWA because I mean, it, you know, it was, it was a lot of killing and uh, a lot of like violent stuff. And I'm oh, so, yeah, a lot of massage in it. And I and and, and, and I, I date myself because 1992 was actually the, the year in which Oakland had its highest rate of homicides in history, till to this day. About 175 folks, which doesn't sound like a lot, but for a city of about 380,000, it's actually quite a bit. Um, we've averaged about, uh, we averaged 138 homicides a year between 83 and 94, uh, which I lost three of my classmates, two friends of mine, one classmate uh, during that time, um, and a cousin. And my, uh, but one classmate that I, was the only homicide I actually saw happen, uh, which was in my 10th grade year. Okay, um, 10th grade I saw my, my first and hopefully only uh, murder. It was after a party. Well, it's a long story, but the point is, is that uh, that's what I saw. Uh, which is pretty important because uh, West LA has about 12.4, roughly, 12 homicides per 100,000 people. Uh, in West LA, which is different than the county. The county only has about seven. And the state is about 5.5, is about right? So you have an elevated homicide rate in West LA, according to the Kaiser Foundation's health report. Uh, you also have a high number of folks that are diagnosed and hospitalized for drug-induced or alcohol-induced mental disorder at about 480 people per 100,000. To put that in perspective, statewide, it's about 100 people per 100,000. You're at about 480 in your service area. Okay? So you have an elevated level of homicide, elevated level of hospitalization due to drug-induced and alcohol-induced mental disorder, okay? which puts you in a very interesting predicament. Okay? Um, sorry, I jumped into stats. My apologies. Um, so my upbringing in Oakland was the, uh, the beautiful struggle, as Talib Kweli calls it, the beautiful struggle, right? So I'll talk to you a little, little bit about that. There's a lot of hardship, there's a lot of violence, but a lot of those families are still here. Many of those students went on to do well. Uh, folks have families of their own that grew up in that era, and that's because of the beautiful part. Okay? And so often in education, we talk a lot about helping marginalized groups and learning about marginalized groups by studying poverty and oppression and suffering. Okay? Well, one of the problems with that is that we're actually getting a very limited view of those communities. Right? And we begin to pathologize them as unusually traumatized and unusually hurt and pain, which isn't really the, the, the case. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that too. So anyhow, grew up in Oakland. Uh, didn't do well in high school early on because it was the crack era. There was a lot of crack cocaine everywhere. I know it was big in L.A. because uh, my cousin stayed out in L.A. It was a blood down here, so I know how big it was down here. Okay, and what that simply meant is not that everybody was on drugs, but it did mean that there was a lot of drug sales going on. Well, of course, I mean, that's going to happen when you have uh, economic uh, hardships and poverty. Um, perpetuated and actually enhanced by Reaganomics at the time to put people in a very a desperate situation in which there wasn't a lot of employment and educational opportunities were something that folks were still trying to build upon in most communities. So what you ended up with was a situation of desperation. And as Paulo Freire talks about, uh, in order to inculcate a sense of um, intra-group violence when folks are trying to prey upon each other and do crazy things, you need to first create a situation of desperation. 
Okay? A coercive economic system such as ours, known as capitalism, but really a high performing capitalism that isn't really actual capitalism, which is what we're in, which creates a coercive environment which I must work in order to put roof over my head, a roof over my head, while simultaneously being highly racially stratified and gender stratified so that certain people have fewer opportunities as opposed to other people. So if in a coercive way, I have to work and in order to get the job, I have to be educated, yet I'm in a racially and gender discriminatory system that makes sure that certain people don't have access as much access to those resources, I'm in a system that by design puts people in a desperate situation. Does that make any sense? Okay, good. So what we start to see then is humans responding to generation after generation of desperation and exploitation, which the types of responses to that are going to be predictable, and when you look internationally, they are fairly well patterned. Okay? People look for ways to earn money to be able to put roofs over their head and eat food. Okay? If those legitimate structural ways are not easily provided and the education in which to make new ways has been either interrupted or um, severely minimized, you end up with a situation where folks are going to grab at whatever they get. Now, if you, you have a little help from the CIA, you have a little help from big time drug dealers, you end up with a lot of cocaine on the streets <laughs> where there are no coca fields. Right, and there are no poppy fields in South Central LA, or I don't know what y'all call it now, gentrification is something else. So, um, uh, wherever they call it now, or in Oakland, or in Detroit, or whatever, um, you don't have the fields to produce, so you have mechanisms to bring that stuff in. And then you have the response from not just Reagan, but the Nixon administration through the Carter administration, which viewed incarceration, of course, as a way of solving these issues. And then so now you take people out of the community and put them in prison, which is prison, which is a revolving door. Uh, hopefully I'm not telling you anything you don't know already. And you end up with a systematic support okay, for inequity and desperation. Okay? So what I'm going to talk to you about is what does that mean for us as educators? What does that mean for the California Community College System? And what does that mean for educators, particularly in environments that have been targeted by these mechanisms for a long time now? How do I shut this? Slide it. Slide it. Oh, there you go. Um, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Because one of the things we want to be mindful of is that if we do work for a state institution, or as I do, a private institution, uh, which represents usually the elite class in one way or the other, even though we are a very um, uh, sympathetic, empathetic Jesuit organization. If you work for a private organization or a state organization, we want to first realize how we have been a part of this subjugation and this oppressive system. I don't know if that makes any sense. This is what I'm saying. Perhaps not you even individually, but you work for an institution that in some way has failed the community. All right? And that's not unique to your college. If you work in higher ed, higher ed is based on the exploitation of marginalized communities. That's the whole structure. Okay, I, okay, I know I sound a little nuts here. Okay. I, I, uh, my, my daddy always say, when we sound crazy, it doesn't mean you gotta explain a little bit more. And so I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. My dad's a acute psychiatric counselor. And he, you know, he's like, it's, it's not the people who's diagnosed you got to worry about. It's the rest of the public you got to worry about. Um, so we're all kind of crazy together. So let me explain a little bit more. Okay, so if you have an institution that is uh, like higher ed systems, right, that are supposed to provide people with certain opportunities, mostly for assimilation purposes and they are based on certain formats of research and certain cultures of research. Um, but yet, these are also spaces in which provide certain communities access to positions of power, generation after generation, like legacy schools and, and legacy participation, okay? So traditionally then, you have higher education, higher education, not trade schools, okay? But higher education, okay? To which later on, trade schools were included into that discussion. Higher education is based on this idea of researching to find answers, find answers to the world's problems. But it doesn't mean that the world is supposed to necessarily be in the institution. <laughs> okay? Uh, and, and, and just so I don't take too much time on this one point, just simply put, if you look at some of your most prominent universities, they are within close proximity 
to some of the poorest, most targeted communities in the United States. And it's been that way since they were built. So if higher ed is supposed to be some type of social change culture, it hasn't been indicated at all in its history and in its, its relative proximity to poor neighborhoods. I mean, I'm from Oakland, Cal Berkeley. Cal Berkeley is right up the street. If you know anything about the Stanford area, East Palo Alto is east of Palo Alto, which is where Stanford is. Okay? These places have had high murder rates, high poverty rates for generations now, at least going back to the 40s, they, they've had high populations of historically targeted people in them. Okay? And you have to ask yourself, what have these universities done to change that predicament? And you can say, well, they've made efforts. Yes, they've made efforts, but my mama made efforts. <laughs> right? I make efforts. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't have an endowment of millions and millions of dollars, right? And I don't have the facilities um, that a university might have. So if they have all that, yet the communities next to them haven't been able to get transformed by that, then there's something going on with the relationship. Because there sure is a lot of research on my people but there sure isn't a lot of help for my people. Does that make any sense? Okay, now, when I say my people, okay, and we're gonna talk about this when, when I address some of the stuff in the article as well. When I say my people, I don't mean black people only. Okay, so what I'm gonna be speaking, to, what I'm speaking to you about now, is this mix between the education and political that can't really be avoided, okay? And when I talk about my people, I mean in solidarity. This is with all people who struggle against oppression throughout the world. Okay? That includes the huge numbers of white Americans that struggle with poverty and oppression throughout the United States. Okay? All my brothers and sisters in Europe as well, of all ethnicities. I just left Poland this summer. It was me with Cass that we had a lot of similar ideas, a lot of similar struggles in mind going against a very strong uh, corporate state alliance throughout the world that continues oppression. So when I say my people, I mean folks that struggle against oppression. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, all right, all right, so. I, I skipped my whole introduction. I, I'll just say the, the, the quick part, okay, the, the quick part. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't like high school. I decided I'd go to college because I thought I could find answers to the homicide rate. That's the only thing I cared about. I didn't really care about nothing else. I came to school, everybody was trying to teach me everything except for why we get killed. Sorry, I, I, I'll fluctuate between black vernacular and academic speech, so <laughs> I say killed. <laughs> killed. Uh, but I, I'll do that fluctuation from time to time. Uh, I, no one would tell me that. So I'd come in classes and everyone's swearing these teachers are smart. But if a third of my school was gone for a funeral, we come back to class and no one can explain why we keep going to funerals for 16 year olds in our city. And cities right next to us don't ever have to do that. I'm feeling like I'm not learning a lot. So when I decided that I wanted to go to college to find answers, I just started doing homework and my GPA went up. Okay. I, I didn't really, no, I'm serious, I didn't care that much about school. I just decided to do homework and all of a sudden I went from a 1.17 to a 3.5, right? And folks were like, how'd you do it? I was like, I stopped caring about learning. It worked perfectly, okay? Um, and then so uh, when I got to college, I went to UC Santa Cruz. After I went to UC Santa Cruz, which I was one of 50 black men out of 10,000 undergraduates there. Uh, we call ourselves Black Escargo for the, <laughs> our, our, our mascot is the banana slugs. Yeah. Black people, we call it Black Escargo. Okay, so anyhow, um, uh, uh, left there, did graduate work in sociology, um, left, uh, left Cal State, it used to be Cal State Hayward, Cal State East Bay, uh, did another master's degree at a private school called New College of California. Um, I, I studied revolutions for two and a half years, got my master's degree in humanities. And then uh, later I got my doctorate in, in educational uh, leadership. Um, but in the meantime, I started a program for high schoolers in Oakland that I taught for 10 years. I heard a K-12 person were respect. Um, I taught 10 years at my alma mater, Oakland Tech High School, which is where Huey P. Newton and my mama graduated. Um, and I, I taught a class on sociology, feminist theory, globalization, and the history of social movements for 10 years to grades 9 through 12. Then after that, I became principal to the Jude Jordan School for Equity in San Francisco. Uh, and then I left that after, uh, I think, three and a half, three years. I got sick and uh, did work for the uh, Foundation for California Community Colleges. So that's how I got into uh, doing a lot of community college work. I used to bring money when I came to community colleges. I was a grant giver. So not I. I don't have any money. 
It was <laughs> the place I worked. <laughs> I, I gave grants to colleges for equity purposes and things of that sort, CTE stuff. Uh, and then I got hired at the University of San Francisco. So now I'm an assistant professor of educational leadership at the University of San Francisco. Okay, so uh, taught at San Quentin State Prison as well as uh, Santa Rita County Jail for maximum security for a while because that's what I like to do. Uh, well, I don't like to go to prison, but I like to teach. And, um, and I did some other things here. Okay, so what I want to talk about briefly, okay, and, um, keep me on time with my phone back. Thank you. All right, so one of the things, and I'll just cut to the chase with you all. Um, so we have this ongoing mystification, I guess it's in our state, but it's not only about the difference between equity and diversity. I'll just cut to the chase. Equity is not equality, right? Equity has to do with justice. Equity is a question of justice, all right? This is what makes it a very complex thing for a community college system or any university, excuse me, or K-12 system to decide to focus on equity. Because, theoretically and structurally, you have been an institution that has participated in solidifying inequity. So when you decide to be about equity, it's a very strange thing for those of us that um, are aware of these dynamics. So let me put it this way. The community colleges were designed uh, to address inequalities in the United States and hopefully address equity by being an open access resource for struggling communities and, and, and non-privileged communities around the United States. It's a beautiful thing. And specifically in California, the California Master Plan for Higher Education was very articulate about this point. We want to provide more access for folks to be trained in particular things, but also have access to transfer to Uni University of California and other four-year institutions like the CSU system and others, okay? It was very clear, okay? And it's been clear in every new iteration of that document since then. The 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s have all clarified that this is what it's for. However, such a goal has been largely underfunded, something that uh, Dr. Bob Greener talks about. It was never adequately funded. But secondly, and, and I'm going to go a little nuts here, but you never had a shot. One of the reasons you never had a shot is because you never had in place, or not, I shouldn't say never, you ceased to have in place the amount of training time, the personnel selection process and hiring, the supervision structures, or the decision making structures to ever make that a reality. I say this because one of the things that was alluded to throughout the iterations of the California Master, uh, Master Plan for Higher Education was that there's inequality. But what they didn't allude to, which is very common of all policy briefs, is that that inequality is not something that just sits outside in society. It exists in all of the institutions that develop us as social participants. Meaning that the discrimination and the inequality is trained in us. So when I come to work at the community college or the K-12 system, if there is no filtering and retraining mechanism, I'm bringing in the ideologies of discrimination and pathologization that I'm supposedly trying to confront through my work. Yes. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay. So the application for the, 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 when I would go to meetings with the chancellor's office, and you know, I'm a black dude in the chancellor's office meetings, so you already know how that's gonna go, okay? <laughs> uh, I, I'm gonna be, you know, quiet, I'm gonna be, you know, you know what I mean. I mean, some of y'all know what I mean, right? Yeah. Okay, y'all know what I mean, right? It, it, it's like, okay, it's, it's, it's like a gendered space. Okay, if, if you're a woman and you're in a space that's all male all the time, okay, you want to speak out, you want to say something, but you don't want to be seen as the crazy woman or the crazy person of color. Y'all know what I'm talking about now, yes? yes. Okay, word, okay. So, so I'm trying to move, maneuver my way around, but I'm learning all this stuff. Like, how many flex days you got? I, you know, we give them like two or three days. What? Wait a minute, let me get this straight. You hire folks, most of which has never been trained in teaching at all. Which can be a good thing, by the way. Okay, no, seriously, it can be a very good thing. Look at our K-12 system. A lot of, most of our teachers have certification in teaching. Not going very well, okay? So, but you have folks that haven't been asked to investigate the art of instruction. You bring them into a space, like the community colleges, where you claim that you're all about instruction. Then you don't dedicate the time 
to support them in their instructional development. There's no, there's no regular appearances, there's no time set aside in most of our colleges for the department chair to be in classrooms. Many of the evaluation conversations are about what students said, but not what the peer has seen. There's, we just started having, we just again, after 20 years, started having collective discussions about inequity in race, which is not so. If you serve 2.4 million people, with over a million of which are people of color, and you're just now having conversations collectively in colleges about inequity in race, you're late. I mean, this is crazy. I'm not blaming you. I'm talking about this is my perspective on the system. Are you following me? Yeah. Are you, are you following me? Yeah. Because yeah. I'm a passionate brother, and people with the passion, you think I'm angry, and they be like, he was yelling at I'm not yelling at you. Okay? I'm serious. I'm not yelling at you. I'm yelling with you. Okay? I'm yelling with you. Okay? Uh, so you end up with a setup. And then so then you come in as faculty and staff, and your thing is, I want to do the right thing. I'm here to teach. And then you have an entire structure set up around you to really undermine the impact that you want to have. Okay? So as we start to talk about equity, folks should feel uncomfortable. It should feel very strange. Okay? California community colleges have half a million Latino students. That's beautiful. The Cal State University system doesn't have as many students as the community colleges have Latino students. Look, the University of California only has under 180,000 students, period, on all 10 campuses. The UC system has under 180,000 students. The California community colleges have 174,000 black students alone. And you are just now as a system talking about equity. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do it. It means that you should feel very uncomfortable because something's really wrong here. And if you're saying, look, why are we suddenly talking about this? Why? You should understand that you've been in a system that has improperly socialized you to think that you can address this issue with no political or social consciousness. Okay? Let me, I, I had a slide on it, but I can tell you. It's not obvious. I can tell you, okay? 1970, Democratic meeting in, uh, excuse me, a Republican uh, it was a Republican fundraiser in Iowa, 1970, okay? Spiro Agnew made the, t made the uh, assertion that a lot of the uprisings that were happening in communities, working class communities, black folks, white folks, Latino folks, Asian folks, right? Uprising, <coughs> calling for not just civil rights, but protection and also advocating for self-protection. He associated this uprising with what he called black student militancy, and that there was too many people of color being allowed into higher education. Okay? You can look it up. It's in H. Bruce Franklin's book, uh, this thing is called The Vietnam War and Other Atrocities. I think that's the title, but H. Bruce Franklin. Okay? And actually, you can just look it up. Type in Spiro Agnew, um, Iowa Republican meeting uh, black student militancy, and the actual documents uh, uh, come up. It was declared later on, Paul Vol Volcker, who was a former advisor to Reagan and Nixon, also e echoed these ideas that there was too much access going on and we're in danger of creating, quote, an educated proletariat. Okay? Proletariat is, you know, Marx's term for working class folks. Okay? Danger of creating an educated proletariat. Okay? During this time, if you know, 1970, we had about 200,000 people in prison in the United States, or at about two and a half million now, okay? Uh, you, you had the uh, Crime and Safe Streets Act that was passed that wanted to uh, make law enforcement more sophisticated, but it also started to shift the funding towards incarceration and away from education. You saw the attack on open access begin to where colleges such as this one, might have been free or next to nothing, the fees started to increase, UC's fees started to increase, and you see this filtering out of folks of education, okay, which is big, okay? All right, I don't want to bore you, but the point is, okay, 
To assume that your position in the college is somehow a depoliticized space in which I'm just here to teach students is not accurate historically or empirically in your situation. If education is truly empowering and we are here to help folks save their own lives, then we have to be intentional in our practice as we design our coursework, work on our pathways, and get rid of institutional barriers to success. That has to be an intentional part of our movement. All right, I don't mean like movement, 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 okay? Like we have to, when I'm designing my curriculum, okay, and, and um, let, let, let me kind of go into this just, just a little bit, okay, because I get all excited. Let me put, put in a, a simple, simple terms here. So one, when we think about removing institutional barriers, you have a lot of movements going on in the state right now um, around acceleration. Right, addressing placement tests, addressing our extra long sequences to basic skills, largely because basic skills is one of those um, log jams that keeps students from succeeding in, in, our, in our system. Now, acceleration is an old concept that goes back at least 40 years because acceleration is not about student ability. Acceleration is about structural impediments to completion. So you, it's not about, oh, students can't do it. No, remember, 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 okay? What if your institution just wasn't very good to begin with? Okay? And, and again, not West LA College. I'm talking about colleges. Are you hearing me? I'm talking about K-12 system. What if we think back to our own schooling experience and think about how many times schools let us down? Bullying, harassment, um, Grade inflation, right? Yes. Coming to school, learning nothing. Yeah. And think about all the awesome people you had in those schools helping you. Why did you think they were so awesome? Because they were so rare. <laughs> <laughs> people say, wow, I had this great, Derek, you don't know what you're talking about. I had these two great teachers. You had two great teachers? <laughs> K-12, you can mention two. Oh no, I had eight, eight, you can mention eight. In high school, you might have had six a year. You can mention eight in K-12, okay? So it's, it's not that people don't care. And it's not that the students just magically don't have skills. It's that we're part of a structure that facilitates a lot of wealth accumulation in one location and everyone else working to support that wealth accumulation. All right, now I know I sound radical, but I don't know how else to be. You got high homicide rates and folks walking around in all of the states acting like we just want to make sure a kid gets a good job. That's not what education is. Ask the CTE folks, man. Go into a welding class, the electricians. See the hands-on tutelage that many of our CTE folks do. It's not just about learning the tool. It's about learning the discipline to be able to use the tool in a safe and effective way. It's about respecting the trade, respecting your colleagues, understanding the history and the social importance of what we do. Very simply, you get that well wrong, you have something falling apart that can hurt people. And in this business, we don't get it wrong. And when you go into the field, you were taught by me. And I don't get it wrong. So that's how I hold you accountable in here, and that's why I hold you accountable in here. All right? That's old school trade apprenticeship. You don't need a, a teaching credential to do that. But it is socially relevant. And as a labor, as a labor intensive, labor class oriented trade, there's politics all through it. All through it, okay? Just visit a CTE, an effective CTE class, you'll see what I'm talking about, okay? So where I'm going with this is that we want to be mindful, and, and, and not just, um, I looked at your equity report, okay? I, I look at all the equity reports when I go to any college, okay? Um, which I don't know why I do. I mean, it's, it's interesting. It's good to know that, you know, half the students aren't finishing English in this semester and half, I mean, that's, I kind of already know what I'm going to see because of the statewide dynamic. Okay, um, and then also because of kind of the statewide dynamic, I know that there's some stats that are almost meaningless to me, like the equity scorecard. Like I'll look at that, I, mean, I don't know what this is. You're judging completion on a six-year trajectory. 
your two-year institution and saying, well, in six years, we, uh, I, I don't care if what you do in six years. That's like asking Cal, like, how do you do on a 12-year trajectory? How many students graduate in 12? They'd be like, sure, 99%. I bet they do in 12, right? But as we approach this, we want to think about our structures as an institution. We want to think about our culture, meaning our collective ideology and our culture as an institution. And we want to think about our pedagogy as instructors and support staff, meaning our method of instruction. If you are a support staff and you don't know you're an instructor, that's, administra that's an administrative problem. That's an ideological problem. Okay? If you are on this campus and you walk past a student, you have to be mindful of how your engagement with students impacts them. You have to have an instructional mindset. I I've been places where the faculty are like, we're all on board. You go in the admissions office and people are rude as hell. <laughs> Well, we're interested in equity. No, you ain't. No, you ain't. <laughs> hey, I'm an I'm a Oakland Raider fan, OK? We got a good quarterback. But if we don't have some other good players, we ain't going nowhere, OK? Like we haven't for a long time. <laughs> OK? So it's the same thing with the college. If we're a team and we have a team ideology, that team ideology has to go from the president's office through faculty down to the custodian. I remember working with, um, I think it was um, Harvard College, and they had a president that he, he left, uh, I think it was a year after I, uh, I was working with him. And one of the things he said, he said, the first thing I did when I got here was I bought a bunch of pizza and held a meeting with the custodial staff. And I said, why'd you do that? He said, because I had to make sure they were on board with the vision. I said, the custodial staff? He, he was like, yeah. They're essential to our campus environment. If they don't know what I'm trying to do and what our faculty need to be doing, then how do we have them on board? How do they feel like a part of this? And then secondly, he said, and then they told me, there's all these opportunities for other faculty. What are the opportunities for custodial staff? He said, so I took part of our discretionary budget, actually he, got a, he had a grant, he had a grant, and he said, so I set up a scholarship fund for our custodial staff. Wow. Right? I thought that was beautiful, right? Because what we were talking about was this idea of creating a, a team ideology for addressing this equity issue. One of those equity issues is your custodial staff looks suspiciously similar <laughs> and suspiciously different from the faculty. So if you're talking about equity, yet there's no opportunities for folks in the custodial staff to achieve their dreams that they want and you're an institution for educational and personal development, you slip in if you're not providing opportunities for your custodial staff, is my point, okay? So you end up with this ideological problem, right? I, uh, okay, so how much time do I have? I'm, I'm going crazy. <laughs> okay, all right, all right, okay, cool, cool, cool. Okay, so let me, I'll make sure I hit a, a couple things and, and not completely lose you here. Okay, so this ideological question, right? So one, in, in your article that you, you read, which I, I, I like, talks about cultural capital. Okay, it's a great thing, great thing, great thing, okay. One nuance to it, okay. Um, in the intellectual discourse of cultural capital, folks talk about cultural capital as what students bring from their cultural experience without necessarily articulating what culture is, okay. So in America, since we're not a very bright society, okay, I mean our educational system, you know, what, you gotta learn like a, I don't know, 10 minutes of Spanish to graduate high school, right? And like, so you go to other countries, like, yeah, I know four languages. How many do you know? I kind of know English, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know? So we're never, we're not the brightest society, right? Uh, we have all the diversity, yet we know none of the languages, right? It's just hilarious. Um, so what we tend to think, we think culture, we think race. And then when we think race, if you don't think race, we think like poverty, okay? Um, and that's not, Culture, right? Culture has to do with norms and artifacts, um, habits and rituals, right? That's the technical term, right? Uh, and, and then this cultural perspective. We think of a perspective of culture that comes from, like, I don't know, race. I, 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 I work with educators, like, yeah, I, I, we should learn more about their culture, okay? So we want to be nuanced about what that means to be culturally responsive and to have folks bring in cultural capital, okay? I'll just say briefly. That when we think about students and what they bring, it, 
Just assume that they actually might be smarter than you. Period. Not about certain things. About many things. This is what I assume. Right? When my students come in, I know certain things. I have a doctorate in this thing. I've worked a couple places. I've done a couple things. So I know a few things. Okay? But I don't know what you know. And you might know some different things about what I know that I ain't never even thought of, which makes you technically a little smarter than me on those things. But that's fine. Because my approach as a teacher and my approach amongst my colleagues has to be one in which we are all in partnership for the purposes of education, right? This is a popular education uh, idea. Um, uh, Peter McLaren, uh, Paulo Freire, right? You can read some of these folks, right? Um, it's the idea that education in the process of teaching is a partnership between two individuals or, or, or more that switch roles throughout the engagement. So I'm a teacher, you a student. That's how you enroll. You're a student, I'm a teacher. But throughout our interactions, we're going to switch roles. That's the assumption of this space. Because in order to teach you effectively, I ought to learn who you are and what you're thinking. Okay? This is when, when, when students challenging teachers is really important. When the student says, hey, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. I love that. Because if you don't know what the hell I'm talking about, that defeats the purpose of you being here. <laughs> so if you say, I don't know what you're talking about, that don't mean I'm stupid. It means that you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so as an instructor, either I got to say it differently, right? Or perhaps secondarily, see if there's any obstructions to you hearing it. But primarily, I'm going to have to say it differently. Like, I try and know how to say things at least five different ways. Because if we're in a diverse setting, blah, 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 if I say it one way, folks might miss it. I mean, think of it from the, the perspective of a, of a targeted population. Like, I, 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 have a, I have a Bay Area lingo. If I came up in here and said, hey, man, things ain't popping off right, you know what I'm saying? Like, let me, let me tell y'all something, man. Cats be hating and J-Cat and all up in this joint. Folks would be like, what the hell is he talking about? And like three people in here would be like, yup. <laughs> now, if I said, oh, no, 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 if, if you, hey, just listen better next time. Anyway, y'all know how these folks be hating. Y'all would be like, this fool came in here speaking some foreign language, and I don't know what the hell he's talking about. He's terrible. Okay, so that's the same as you as an instructor, okay? We have to be able to say things in multiple ways to make sure our students get the point. And if, and, and I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump, I'm getting, is this okay, are you guys all right? Yeah. Okay, so look, check it out, check it out. I, I think about this when we think about issues of discipline. So I'm a K-12 guy, my, 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 my research agenda is around school discipline, okay? So I'm a big critic of these disciplinary issues uh, in K-12 and in the college system. Okay, I was just at a, a conference in Atlanta. Six people got up and walked out in the middle of my presentation. They were very upset. Uh, but not 30 people stayed. But six, and, they, and it was sad because they, they, were all, they were all white, and like three other white people stayed. And then everybody else of color stayed. Only, it wasn't a conference of color, it was, it was not. But a lot of people of color came, came to my session. And I was talking about discipline issues and the critique of the discipline discussion. Right. You guys want to hear anything about that? Yes. Yes. Okay, and, and one of the reasons why I think it might be important is because community colleges now are experiencing, or are talking about their experience with discipline. Okay. Um, and it just so happens to be in, in areas where the school districts are struggling with discipline. Strange, right? Um, and so there's all this conversation. I'm not going to go all into it. But, but my point with when I work with faculty and administrators, my, my first question is, what are the boundaries of your educational space? What are the boundaries of your classroom or your school? Are those boundaries rooted in a particular purpose of empowerment for students and in interest of the discipline in which they're studying? Okay. And are those boundaries and expectations clarified to students at the beginning of their educational experience and maintained throughout? Because usually the answer to almost all of those is no. No, and I don't know. Okay? So then you end up with folks responding to certain dialogue in classrooms, a certain dynamics in classrooms, in a variety of ways. Folks would then call them disruptive, and in the traditional American sense, want to get rid of them. Okay? Again, we're talking in terms of, we go quickly back to what the community's flaws are 
without acknowledging that your, institutional is in, your institution is insufficient in delivering the service it claims to deliver. Listen to what I'm saying. This is K all the way through, to, through higher ed, OK? I'll give you an example. People like examples. They're like, hey, what are you talking about? Give me an example. OK. So when I taught at Laney College and De Anza College in Cupertino, OK, I taught SOCH mostly for nursing students, OK? About 84 students in my class or whatever, OK? We start off by talking about what sociology is. Why is it socially significant, OK? It's pretty easy with SOCH, but some of my colleagues like uh, 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 Jeff, Jeff at San Mateo, Jeff Flowers at San Mateo, he's a chemistry teacher, he does this as well, right? So, sociology, what is, it, what is it about? Why is it socially important? And why should it be important to you? Okay, you. Not you as a person, just you. You in the city that you're in. You given the identity based on the data that we have. You given the history, okay? Now, what do we need in this classroom for you to learn the essentials of how to succeed or perhaps even defeat this system. Okay? I need you to pay close attention when I'm speaking. I need you to pay close attention when each other is speaking because we need to have an atmosphere of respect. Okay? Why is respect important? Because respect helps us feel powerful and it builds collaboration and solidarity amongst us all. Okay? Why is that important? Because according to the data, you all in the damn near the same boat, okay? And so we all need to have an, 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 an era of, of solidarity, okay? When I'm talking, this is what I don't like, okay? I don't want any side talking. The reason why we can't have side talking is because I don't know what you're saying, okay? We're in a dangerous country. You could be whispering a threat. I don't know, okay? You could be harassing someone. I wouldn't know. And as the protector of the space, as the instructor, can't let that happen, okay? So I can't have side talking for that reason, okay? We go over these rules that I think are important according to the learning space and my discipline in the first class. But it's not just these are my rules. This is where educators make the mistake. These are my rules. No, they ain't your rules. They're old rules of humanity that you can find in their very community. <coughs> You're not introducing civility and hospitality and love to students because they come from targeted backgrounds. How do you think they're still alive? They're still alive because their family somewhere in it or their peers somewhere in them had those values already. See, it's the news and media that convince you that folks are in struggling positions because they lack values. That's BS. They're in struggling positions because it's structured to put them in struggling positions. And the only reason they're still here is for two reasons. One, the system needs to exploit them. And two, because they have values of survival, which are all about love and respect. Okay? So when we think about these rules, they're not just my rules. They're our rules. And then you ask them, are, is there any other rules that we need to add? Is there something you want to edit? <laughs> Serious. And then your first class is spent going over what the hell this thing is about, right? And what we are gonna be like while we're here. Then you talk about the consequences in the end. What do you guys think of this reasonable consequence if someone keeps violating these rules? I would like to disenroll them from the class. What do you all think? You need folks to say, uh, yeah. I mean, if they do that twice, they need to be kicked out. <laughs> have everyone agree or Man, maybe they should have a conversation with you like the first time, and I don't know, maybe they might need help, maybe they get a referral, okay? What this does is it creates a consensus and agreement. So then when something disruptive or crazy happens, you only have one person that may oppose your consequence, and that's the person that's doing it. And if, when they're doing it, you remind them of the agreement that we all made, the whole class are not, and be like, yup. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what we agreed on. Why are you tripping? Okay? And when you pull a student out of the class to talk with them, you're talking about the ethics of the class and the discipline, why we are here. It's not about your power. It's not about your class. You know it's not about your class because you can switch classrooms every day and quarter semester. So it's not about the room. It's about the people in it. And it's about the ethics behind it. This is how we deal with discipline. K-12 is horrible at it. Why? Because it's a racist system. Of course it's going to be horrible at it. 
been throwing, look, the first report on disproportionate suspensions came out by the Children's Defense Fund in 1975. Okay? The progress we made since 75 is next to nothing. Next to nothing. That's in the K-12 system. Why? Because you criminalize the poor, you criminalize the non-privileged folks, no matter what ethnicity they are, all over the United States. So it makes sense it would happen in your primary institution of maintaining the status quo, which is education. Does that make any sense? Yes. Okay? So, so in cl closing, 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 closing. Okay. <laughs> so, so what are we talking about here? So, so what, Derek? You complained a lot and you yelled at us. Okay, great. All right, so this is what I'm saying. Our professional development, a purposeful professional development. Okay, and, and um, no, don't don't tell that story. It's, I was going to tell a story, there. but the point is, our professional development, a purposeful, has to really be about faculty learning. You'll see this throughout the state. Folks talk about faculty learning, but learning what? <coughs> learning what? Okay. Poverty. It's good to study poverty. Some people like trauma now. So like people love to talk about trauma, which I think is. It's a great discussion, but a lot of people are completely incapable of having it. So we don't start where we should start. We start too far ahead. But let's talk about the trauma that the students are going through that's, that's, that's stopping them from being successful. No, that's not where you should start. You should start with how many people in the United States experience trauma? <coughs> Roughly, statistically, it's two thirds. So that means that I have a two. That means our faculty has a two. Our administration has it too. Hmm. How do we manifest our trauma? Hmm. How, do, how are our structures created based on a certain traumatized perspective in our institution? That's a whole, read Mab Seagrest, Souls of White Folks. She talks about this. Um, she's a wonderful uh, white uh, feminist professor. Anyway, we have to examine this question of, of, of trauma, for example, from a perspective, again, our institutional critique. All right? Because if you think about it, if most Americans were traumatized, then why are we talking about trauma only for people of color and poor people that happen to be students? That's crazy. Because that creates this constructs this image of them is unusually disturbed, which is the definition of pathologization. Right? And they said, well, how do we service them? But look, first of all, is your institution effective in what it was supposedly structured to do? The answer to that is no. Okay? If a student makes it to your classroom and decides to sit down, are they invested enough to get the skills that you are there to teach? Some people say yes. So then the question becomes, how educated are you as a faculty to teach anyone, period? If you can't graduate folks or move folks through your system, regardless of ethnicity, look at your white and Asian completion rates. Those are not at 90%. Okay? When you look at that and you go through it, you find that you're just, we're, we're just as systems, we're not very good. So what do we do? We have to study. And what do we study? We study under the framework of alliance, not just service, alliance. So what does that look like? Two things we want to make sure that we're getting at. One, we want to study the community that we serve. The stats I gave you were out of a public health report from the Kaiser Foundation. Every staff person should know those stats because it tells you about your community. You want to study the history of the community. Thank you. You want to study the history of the communities that you serve. What's the history? When your article talks about cultural capital, they don't mention resistance. Resistance. Okay. Why can I be defiant in a classroom? Because I learned if I stay quiet and don't learn nothing, but I'm paying you, that means I got exploited. And every time I stay quiet in this community, I get hurt. So you think I'm crazy, but actually I'm really smart. Because I ain't about to let you get over on disrespecting me and not teaching me after I pay for this. Now, your question as a faculty member is how do you bridge the gap and say, actually, it's not me. You paid the institution in this system. I am here to be with you. And that's why we have the dialogue in, in the first day of class and continue that dialogue. I'm here with you. If you have a question, raise your hand. I promise I'll get to you. 
If I miss you, raise your hand again later. Let me know that I missed you and I will apologize to you. If I interrupt you, it's because I think you might be disrupting somebody else. Please believe me, I'm not trying to disrespect you. I just want to keep the class moving. Why are you calling on me and not them? Oh, I apologize. I didn't even notice them. I, I missed that. I'm so sorry. Human. Not an authoritative person to deliver some state curriculum or curriculum out of a corporate textbook. A human being in partnership invested in the education and development of the individual that you see. So the cultural capital discussion, oh, they know hip hop, let's play hip hop. Do you know the history of the Black Panther Party in LA? Your students might not know that either, but you might find an interesting link if you can incorporate that in your curriculum. Where's the environmental racism discussion in your science courses? There's too much asthma in West LA, diabetes. Where's the institutional environmental racism in that? That's in science. Math? Talk about home ownership, mortgage rates, population movement, poverty decentralization or gentrification. That should be in your, 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 your quantitative studies classes. Politics, you can go forever on politics. Okay? And all of the trades are based in old school labor ethics. Talk about union organizing. Talk about the history of union resistance. The struggles against corporations, because why? Many of those things are folks having similar experiences and sharing similar struggles throughout history. This is what we must do. And if we're not doing it, and then we turn around and say, well, our students aren't succeeding, I'm going to tell you that was the original design, and then I'm going to ask you, how have you tried to contradict the original design? Okay? So as alliance builders, we want to study. We want to go back and reflect and figure out, how do I make my material relevant, period? Mm -hmm. People say culturally relevant, but most of, the, most of the country is working class. Okay, when I, when I spoke in Davenport, uh, uh, Davenport, Iowa, for a school district, and they brought all of their students that had been flunking and gang members and dope dealing and suspended for drug possession, all in one room. They are like, Mr. Smith, I don't know what you're going to say, uh, <laughs> but we brought you here. They kick off this program, and I don't know what to tell you, just say something to get them invested, because everybody in there hates the fact that they're here today. I walk into the room, it is all white. All. Because I'm in Iowa. <laughs> I, was in, I was at Butte College last week. I was at Shasta College last year. Okay? What do we talk about? We talked about the union organizing and the resistance by the miners in the area, the loggers in the area. What were the ethics of that? What are the family values? You find those family values are consistent throughout all of the ethnic communities in the area, consistent. Immigrants, citizens, uh, 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 undocumented folks, it doesn't matter. It, the, the values are similar. The question is, does the college have the values that the families have? And they usually don't. People are backbiting, undercutting, toxic administration, toxic support systems, no peer support, no, no collectivism whatsoever, some type of ignoring of all politics that exists outside of the college for some strange reason. People try and do something innovative, people get pissed at them because they're trying to do something innovative and blah. I mean, it's not so. So, and I'm not saying that's your college. I'm saying this is what I find. No, no, I'm serious. I'm not saying it. And so, so in closing, let me shut up, because I've been talking to you a while. So, in closing, okay, we want to be reflective on how we do this in a way that honors our students, but also honors ourselves. All right, not as um, members of the institution, but as humans that chose to be in education. Right? How do you introduce yourself to your students? How do they learn about who you are throughout the process? It's okay to tell them hard stories. It's, it's okay to share who you are, and I know it's scary, and, and, and it's a risk, but, but we're asking them to take a risk every time they pay to come here. All right? And, and, and the, the last <clears throat> promise, the last thing I'll say is when I, when I talk to, uh, I'm not going to name a college, but I talk to a few colleges, and they talk about they're we're trying to give our students hope. And I said, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Because it's a community college. 
The hope argument is from one of my friends and colleagues, uh, Jeff Duncan Andrade, and of course he gets it from Fede, the popular education tradition of hope. But he's talking about K-12 largely, where it's compulsory ed, you gotta come, by law. Okay. Higher ed, people pay to come. They take three buses to get here after organizing childcare. They come after work, they come sick. They send their friends to come get the work for them. All right? They don't need hope, you do. <laughs> right? And so as a team, it, I'm, not, I'm not trying to tell you that you're not doing it, I'm trying to tell you that you're in an institution that is not really fit to do it, but they're in the position to do it, okay? So I'm really urging you to continue your work. I don't want to dissuade you, and I'm not saying that you're the problem. I'm saying, like all of us, we are attached to institutions that maintain a condition that we individually do not agree with. And so we want to be intentional, <coughs> articulate, clear about what we are doing about them as infiltrators within this structure. And as we do that, things will begin to work out. But it won't work out without us taking risks, being uncomfortable, and being a little embarrassed at times. Because that's what learning is. Okay, thank you. Good.